the Holy Gospel according to John 16th chapter. Now Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own, but will speak whatever He hears, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, because He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is Mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Holy Trinity Sunday. The Trinity, the Trinity is a uniquely Christian experience. The Trinity is a uniquely Christian experience of Father God, of Jesus, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now we began with Apostles' Creed in our worship today. The Apostles' Creed is a faithful way to talk about experiencing God. And it invites us to believe in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. It says it right in the Creed, I believe in. The Father, I believe in the Son, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. And our our Bibles document that Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Christian faith is built on this Trinitarian understanding of God as three in one, the Father, Spirit, Son. Yet, curiously, this word Trinity isn't found in the Bible. It's not a biblical word. Instead, it's a word that's used to try and describe, since since the earliest churches, trying to simplify for us a concept about God that can be hard to wrap our minds around. Now, Around the world, there are religions based on monotheism. Have you heard of this before? Monotheism, one God? For example, Judaism and Islam. There's other faiths of many gods. Polytheism, right? You've heard of these. Monotheism, polytheism. For example, polytheistic is the Hindu religion, right? Panoply of gods. But Christianity is unique in the world religions because it is neither monotheistic nor polytheistic. Christianity is Trinitarian, which is unique in the history of the world. Trinitarian theology is three in one is neither monotheistic nor polytheistic. It's something altogether unique. All for one and one for all. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yet, when pressed to explain how this all works, it can become quite difficult for us to understand And it's hard for language to hold all of the understanding in one word when pressed to understand the Trinity. So so let me share a joke with you to hopefully relieve a little bit of the tension of this word, of this concept of Trinity, of the Holy Trinity. So Jesus once asked, who do people say that I am? Well, some people replied saying, well, others say you're John the Baptist and some others say you're Elijah. But Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And that's when one disciple stood up and said, thou art the Logos, with each member of the Trinity co-equal with every other member, each acting inseparably with an interpenetrating every other member, with only an economic subordination within God, but causing no imminent divisions. And Jesus said, what? 
And Jesus said, what? What? Well, there's a lot about God our Father, the Son of God, sacrificed for us that resonates with my experience of faith and life and death. But now this Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is something even altogether more unique than the Trinity because it, it's a different kind of importance because the Spirit never dies. We remember that Jesus died. I don't think the Father dies, but the Holy Spirit never dies. The Holy Spirit somehow never dies. It's death proof. So if your greatest fear is avoiding death, trust in the spirit of God's trinity. Follow the spirit. Now, if you want to understand suffering and righteousness, follow Jesus. Jesus is going to show us how to live our lives, but the spirit will help us live our spiritual lives, this eternal life, the spiritual self that God has given to us as a gift. The spirit of God's trinity does not die. And so we trust Jesus when he says, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is found in Matthew chapter 28. Now this is important because, as you've probably heard it before, this is Trinity Sunday. The only church festival day celebrated for teaching this, this sacred concept of the Trinity of God. This, this word, teaching the Trinity. The Trinity. It's a word that's worthy of our meditation, worthy of our prayer. A word that we can ruminate upon and reflect upon. A word that is prayer-like. The Trinity. Now, another interesting word that I learned in seminary while trying to understand the Trinity is the word that describes how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, how they, how they get along, so to speak. And this is the word perichoresis. Perichoresis. Now, I know it sounds probably like a disease, but it's not a disease, it's actually the cure. It is the way that God acts for help and healing in our world. And this, this, this word, it might not be something you expect because this word perichoresis actually means to dance. To dance in a circle. And in fact, it's the ultimate praise dance. How many of you saw Leah do a praise dance last week for Pentecost? I was here for that. Amen. But this is a praise dance that God is doing with the world, with us, that is in a continual circling. Almost like what happens during communion when we, when we move around our worship space, moving around. God, God invites us to get up and keep moving around and around. We gotta get up. We gotta keep moving. Because God not only invites us to feel and get in touch with our emotions, but God also helps us to keep in motion. God helps us to get up, to get, to get down, round and round. The church revolves within God's trinity, turning us from selfishness, turning us good, turning us right round to everything turn, turn, turn. So perichoresis is partner dancing with God. Now, I was looking for images of the Trinity in, in our stained glass here. I found a couple. Um, this is an ancient one. Uh, Andrei Rublev, uh, Orthodox Christian, painted this image of the Trinity in this circle around the Holy Communion in the center. This is an uh, example that's trying to explain the Trinity in terms of water. There's a trinity of water too, right? Ice, vapor, and liquid. Water has these three states that both are and are not equal to one another. And so this is one graphic that was trying to describe how the three in one can happen in our world in a, in a, 
in a very profound way. But here, uh, this is another person, another church's window. But I'm certain I have some. Here we go. Okay, if you look up, this is the image up there. And we have, coming down from the top, we have this, this hand with the three fingers, right, pointing down. And we have the dove representing the Holy Spirit. We have the Jesus Christ in glory with the Lordship. Now I found this one, this Trinitarian blessing as well, is up on this window up here at the very creation story. And I even notice that there's three doves that fly through the scene above the Adam and Eve and the nature scene in the garden up in this creation window. But this perichoresis, it's hard to put into a, a visual concept for us, but here's a couple, a, a dancing around circle. The circle dance. Again, this strange Greek word perichoresis refers to the eternal dance of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Theologians have long recognized that dance is perhaps one of the best ways of portraying the way the Godhead interacts, including humanity in the relationship of the Trinity. Interesting, this word perichoresis, to move within oneself, to keep moving and turning with God. Perichoresis as a, as a partner dance with God. Just, just don't step on God's foot while you're dancing along, right? But this word perichoresis was first used about 1,300 years ago by a church historian named John of Damascus. So it's an ancient word. It's not something new. I'm not bringing something up for the first time. This is an ancient way to describe how God is in the world experiencing us to describe how God can move through our lives and interact with us on every level. And I found this also interesting that John Damascus also wrote this. He says, I do not worship matter, I worship the God of matter, who became matter for my sake and deemed to inhabit matter, who worked out my salvation through matter. I will not cease from honoring that matter which works for my salvation. I venerate it, though not as God. You hear some of the resonance of, of dealing with how do we worship God, but not just the image of God? How do we worship God, but not just a, a, an isolated picture of God? How do we worship God of nature, the God of matter, of all that matters? John of Damascus helps us Imagine this as, as God dancing with the universe. God, the Father, the Son, and Spirit, the, the trinity of perichoresis. Now, it's still funny to me how biblical scholars can wind up with the best way to describe how God interacts with the world as a dance. These are biblical scholars who continue to use this word to try and describe how God interacts with the world as the Trinity. The closest metaphor is being like a dance. So, okay, we can accept that. God likes to dance. I'm okay with that. I like to dance. Amen. So I guess the only question left is, so you think you can dance? So let's sing about our dancing partner, God. We're going to sing our song, our song, our hymn of the day is literally, come join the dance of Trinity. So let's keep this, this idea going. Let's, let's keep thinking about how God interacts with us in our lives and in our joy and in our, in our hope. Please rise as we sing our hymn of the day, come join the dance of Trinity.